Good evening, everyone. Um, welcome to um, our evening conversation. Uh, my name is Juan Juan. I am a member of the Racial uh, Equity Commission here in Malden. Um, for record, uh, uh, Kashona Harley convening this evening. Um, before we go ahead and get started, it's obvious that many of you are here because you believe wholeheartedly or want to make an impact with respect to diversity, equity, inclusion here in Malden. So I, um, in the essence of time, I will go ahead and just turn it over to our mayor, Kelly Christian. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Barn. Good evening, everyone. Again, I'm Gary Christensen, Mayor of the City of Malden, and I not only want to welcome you here this evening, but also say thank you for being here on such an important issue. And I want to let you know it's important not just in words, but in actions. In preparing for tonight, I believe that you'll be pleased to know that we are making progress. Now, we have more work to do. But again, progress is being made. Off to my left, your right, we have a full-time diversity, equity, inclusion officer, Kashawn Howley. Um, I wish I could get that loud in the floor. And, this was with the ball and um, what? The 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 I see what happens when you put the mayor and the council in chat. <laughs> this is not how the government runs each day. I want to assure you with that. Uh, but as I was mentioning, uh, we have Kashana Harlan with us, and she, along with our previous EEI officer, have made progress here in the city of Malden. In looking over uh, for tonight's presentation, uh, one thing that we have done that I think has made a tremendous impact for us is uh, Kashana is on every single hiring panel across the government. And what that has meant for us is uh, we were less, we had less than 5% of people of color working for the city. And as of June 30th, 2023, uh, the state notified us, they now believe Malden City Hall, Malden government has 20%. So in just a couple of years, we are making strides. Now, again, we have more work to do, but I want to assure everyone, it's not just the name on why we're here tonight. Uh, another thing that impressed us in looking over where we are, we now have 70 people across the government that speak 20 different languages. Prior to your involvement in your advocacy, I think we have less than a handful. And it's just not here at City Hall, but also what we believe is just as important as what we do during the day is what goes on during the night. So a lot of our boards and commissions working with Kashana, we've spent a lot of time trying to make sure they reflect what our community has become. So prior to this effort, we had, again, less than a handful uh, from diverse backgrounds representing us on these boards and commissions. Uh, as of today, we have roughly 40 people. So again, baby steps. We have more work to do, but progress is being made. And it's not just here at City Hall, and it's just not with the boards and commissions. It's also with ourselves. So both the city council, our office, as well as the school committee has all undergone anti-bias training, not just once, annually. And all of our staff and directors here at City Hall have done the same. So again, there are many issues to choose from during the day. I can tell you that. You'll see them in my tell-all book. But this is one that we will not let go of. We are committed to this. We want to see Malden become all that it can and should be. And it starts and ends with you. So again, on behalf of our city, welcome and thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, so in the interest of time, I'm going to be kind of super quick because I really want to get into the meat of why we're here. Um, but I just want to introduce myself as the new diversity, equity, and inclusion coordinator for Malden. Um, I want to let you know, just from the bottom of my heart, I'm truly honored to be able to have this position. I'm super excited about doing this and to be able to do something that's going to contribute to the city that I live in. 
Um, it's super important to me to have a feeling, what I want from Alden, my vision is to have a feeling of belonging for everyone. Um, and I think that covers so many things. So in terms of being able to know where the right place to get resources from, um, having them in languages in which you can understand them, um, to be able to feel like you're valued and included in the community. So to have these meetings like this, where we can say, well, what do you guys want to tell us? What is important for um, for you? What do you want to see have in, happen in the city to have it improve? Um, and the feeling of just being valued. So having events in the city where, where we celebrate our culture and our diversity um, to just be able to gather, have some education and trainings where we can have uh, you know a lunch and learn or, or some uh, night events where we can kind of learn about each other, how to build and make the city a better place. Um, so I will hurry up and end my spiel, um, but just some of the goals that we have, some specific goals is one to have a DEI strategic plan for the city. So I would like to have, you know, a one to three year plan to start with at least, um, because I feel like timelines and to have some type of a plan is super important. I live by them. Um, and I feel that when you have these things, it, it gives you a level of accountability and to be able to check back and say, okay, this is where I should be and why am I not there? And what do I need to do to kind of improve? So I feel that if we could have this strategic plan um, and just kind of build what do we need to fix in the city um, or to improve in the city. And also I want to, for the workplace, I would like to start looking at our hiring practices more. Um, so Vivios, the previous diversity inclusion officer, she did a wonderful job on, on hiring and, and really getting diversity into the into City Hall. Um, so I'd like to see that continue and to also make the workplace culture better for everyone. I'm into mental health, education, um, and I feel like all that is really good to kind of bring us together to to be a city of belonging. So I'm excited to begin this work and I think this today is, is the start of something wonderful. So I'm happy to do this with you all and thank you for having me. Oh. So uh, next who's gonna be leading the discussion, um, an amazing, amazing uh, person, um, Dr. Maritza, Maritza Barrow. So she's an inaugural full-time lecturer in the Diversity, Equity, Inclusion and Justice Leadership Program. Um, she also uh, is a member of uh, worked at Tufts University, and she's also the DEI JAP, and that's Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, Justice, Accessibility, and Belongingness Consultant. So um, it's my honor to welcome her to. <laughs> good evening. Good evening. I'm really not a fan of the podiums. <laughs> But I, I, I think for the Zoom folks, I have to stay in the mic. <laughs> yes. All right, all right, that's all right. So I am going to help ground us and I'm just gonna move to the, the side here. How's everybody doing? Thank you all for your patience as we get started we're doing uh, really important work. And my, my job is really to help ground this conversation so we can try to normalize, um, trying to identify these challenges. I like to think of myself as a solution. Um, oriented person. I am coming through with a particular framework and how I do this work. And also I'm not here alone. I'm here with my team from HCA. So I just want to give them a shout out. I'll be uh, joined by Nicole very soon. But you'll see here uh, a framework for equity and inclusion. It's important to have a framework and an understanding of how we're coming into these conversations. And there's three levels in which we can enter this conversation. I think the level we just heard from comes from the systems level, uh, where we think about organizationally our uh, practices, our policies, structures, and things of that sort. Today, we're really going to ground the conversation at the level of self. And so you see the SQ here. Um, F oh. Here we go. SQ uh, stands for self, spheres of influence, and this is actually better here if I can. Did I not join the audience? All right. So system, spheres of influence, and the self. So today we're getting grounding to the self, really trying to understand what is my role, how can I contribute? What's my ownership and my responsibility in this work, right? Because this work is too heavy of a burden to be on the shoulder of one person or one commission, right? So 
Today we'll, we'll be at the grounded at the self level, and we'll also, I think, if we can develop the self, naturally tap into our spheres of influence, right? Whether that's personal or professionally. Uh, and there's one belief I want you all to hold with my frame, uh, framework here, and I believe it myself, right? Having this belief that every person in an organization has the ability, the capability to change. We have to believe that. Um, otherwise, it's, it's really difficult to carry this burden, right? So with that belief, we want to consider a few things. So I'm going to help frame us and ground us in this conversation because I don't want us to bring in our regular everyday minds, okay? There's a lot going on in the world. There's a lot going on for people personally. And when you come into this space, what is the one thing we all hold as, as humans? Anybody want to take a, a try? What is one thing every human has? Buy it. Exactly, right? And when it comes to bias, it's not a matter of if, but when. And so we want to really uh, come in with a conscious thinking. And one thing we want to consider in having these conversations, we don't all know everything that there is to know. Okay, there is no such thing as an expert. I stand up here with a uh, expertise in this work, but I do not claim to be an expert. Nobody is an expert. So we can just let down our guards, right? We don't have to be so um, proper or be mindful of how we're showing up and what we're saying and how we're saying it. Uh, but there is, has to be a way we can create a space for some form of I'll say safety, but you'll see soon enough why I don't like to lean too much on safety because I cannot guarantee you safety in these conversations, but definitely bring great courage. Um, the other thing is to recognize that this is lifelong work, folks. This is not something you just come into work, take on the professional development training, and then leave it at, at the office. This is actually something we have to own personally. Um, just as difficult as conversations can be in the office, Imagine us on dinner tables, right? How that can be. So we really have to develop our skills and make a commitment to, to do this work daily. And then that looks like different things for different people. Know that I continue to do this as a facilitator myself, right? And um, I lead with cultural humility because I know I too can potentially cause harm unintentionally. And so we continue to have to do this work and know that there's no ending. Uh, we heard some great um, strides from the mayor that has been made, but as been made, that progress and we're going to continue moving forward. It's important to celebrate the wins because this is, this is hard work, right? Some of undoing of many years um, of disparities and harm that's been going on. So we want to celebrate those wins, but know that there's no arrival point. There's a North Star, if you will, in our pursuit to inclusive excellence. But we'll never get to a place where we're going to say we're done. So that sometimes it feels a little daunting, but it's good to live in that reality that this is something that you do every day, just like you work out or try to eat well, you know, take care of your mental health. This also becomes a part of that self development. Um, in this work, and, and I wanted to share these thoughts with folks because I knew that the community members that would show up, commissioners, y'all are deep into this work. You're committed, and um, there are things you have to consider in this work. When we talk about diversity, diversity in its definition, we're going to talk definitions in a few, but uh, it's very broad, right? There's a breadth and a depth to that term. And so we have to know that we cannot distance ourselves from the issues. Something that may not impact you directly or is not salient to your own identity is not a uh, permission to distance yourself from the issue. Right, so keep that in mind. In doing this work, we have to work to disrupt this process in our own sphere and move into this liberation mindset. So all of us have been socialized, right, in this American culture, society. Um, we were born into families and into this world not by choice, right? But when you move into a liberated mindset, you're making conscious choices about the decisions you make, values you hold, um, beliefs that you keep, 
because they all shape your attitude, right? And your attitude influences how you engage with it in a cross difference. So you have to work to consciously disrupt things that may just be automatic, or that's just how it's always been. That's just how my culture um, does things. We have to work to move into a conscious way of thinking. We do also want to center learning via a developmental process. What this means is that not only do we meet people where they are, but we allow people to develop at their own pace, right? And, and try to do that with compassion. Because what may uh, offer an aha moment or awaken you in a moment might just be the seed that is planted for somebody else to later on to be enlightened or awakened in, in whatever way that is. So keep that in mind so that compassion when it's necessary for centering um, learning in this developmental process. And then we always want to raise our, it's maintaining that raised consciousness so that we can be seeking to develop new language seeking to adopt tools and skills that are going to help us sharpen our ability to engage within and across difference, right? Just um, a few years ago, the pandemic broke and the racial marketing, you know, there was a term that came out that even I wasn't familiar with, and I'm in this work, and I heard BIPOC, and I'm thinking to myself, what is BIPOC? I should know this. But that's okay. That's the culture of humility, and that's your continuous um, Willingness to learn and be open to change as it comes. All right. So uh, another piece about framing in having these conversations, especially um, in the, this space and future conversations that we'll have as we start really getting into the weeds today, we're trying to get y'all to help Kashana get more information to feed into her specific plan. Um, but as things get more vulnerable in the conversations, it's really important to recognize that we all come into this conversation with our lens, um, and, and our lens are used to interpret what's familiar and unfamiliar. Just by looking at me or looking at someone in the room, you don't know what they're carrying and the many cells that they're bringing into the space. So you have to be mindful that, again, in this cycle of socialization we've all uh, been a part of, we bring with us our lived experiences, our family history. We bring with us our ideals, values, and beliefs, our societal influences, influences and media right, that we've been exposed to in our upbringing, our social historical context, and even our understanding of history. Right? We know that some history is known, others have been hidden, others have been changed a little. All of your contextual understanding in that area also influences how you interpret what's familiar and unfamiliar to you. And then there's obviously so much more, right? So keep that in mind as we're sharing um, thoughts and, and opinions and experiences. Um, so that when we have conversations, we can try to create a space for folks to be as authentic as possible, right? And so in doing so, again, in making sure that we're conscious about how we show up, I like to always uh, bring shared agreements into the room. You might obviously be familiar with shared agreements. You might have heard it before as ground rules or community norms. I purposely stay away from those terms because who's Who's determining that it's, it's the norm or that it's a ground rule, right? So a shared agreement is a set of agreements that we share and say, I commit to showing up in this way for others to be able to be their authentic self and hopefully you too can be as authentic as possible. Notice I did not say your whole self, right? <laughs> your whole self, uh, especially in a place of work being um, realistic and authentic is, is maybe not what you want, but your authentic, authenticity and creating a space of um, courage for folks to be able to be frank is important. So I have some shared agreements, and shared agreements can always be uh, developed organically, even in meetings. Yeah, folks can go around the room and talk about what is it that you need to be your authentic self. We obviously don't have the time for that today. So I'm going to share some uh, shared agreements with folks, and I'm going to ask for your feedback. Are we in agreement with these shared agreements? Is there anything missing that we want to call out and name in this space today? Okay. So the first one, take space, make space. 
This one is, is all about self-reflection and being honest with yourself. We are all introverts and extroverts depending on the environment we're in, right? If you feel and notice that you're taking a lot of space, make space for others. If you notice you haven't really spoken up, know that your thoughts and ideas are valued and necessary and we want you to take some space uh, and speak up. What is said here stays here, but what's learned here is here, right? So this is an opportunity for us to develop trust and have some sense of confidentiality, but of course, the things that you learn here, we want you to take on and uh, influence your own spheres. A brain safe, so this goes to that safety component, right? I cannot guarantee the safety in these conversations. If you think about the lens that we just went and spoke about, it, it would it, it would not be authentic for me to say that. So instead, I want us to be able to create a brain safe so we can be courageous because we are uh, creating this space around these shared agreements. One mic, one speaker helps us keep a respectful conversation. Offer what you can and ask for what you need. Really centers that level of humility that we want to lead in these conversations. Expect and accept lack of closure. Not everything is going to be able to be closed with a, a pretty bow at the end of the conversation, and that's okay. Um, it doesn't mean that we shy away from differences of opinions or potential conflict, right? Sometimes you have to go through some darkness to get to the light, but know that the conversations will continue, and as long as we show up in these shared agreements, um, we should be able to work through. And how do we create bravery, right? We can't come into a space and feel that we're going to be judged. Uh, so we've got to assume that the people who are here are here because they're willing and they want to learn. They want to help improve, do better themselves, and so on. So we want to assume good intentions. So if somebody said something that sounds wrong or maybe felt a particular way for you, it, with that assumption of good intentions, it allows us to dig in deeper to those conversations. We want to be specific, be thorough, and embrace a growth mindset. Right, so that if, if if I'm the one who makes a mistake or causes a harm, that I have this whole mindset and that ability to, to receive that feedback so that I can do better. Uh, keep calm and respect others. We want to seek to understand before being understood. That's another good one, right? It's really easy to hear people and just ready to respond. Um, for making sure that your point is understood, but if we all seek to understand before being understood, we're able to get some deeper understanding. And then uh, call in before the call out. Uh, one of my students actually named it this way, and I really liked it because there is maybe a point that a call out is necessary, but before we jump to a call out, let's call each other in so that we can uh, create more space. So uh, don't do not think outside the box, folks. Think like there is no box. <laughs> That's about limitless thinking, right? Limitless possibilities. Um, we've got to really take advantage of having diverse perspectives um, and the opportunity to fill each other's gaps so that we can get to new solutions and more creative um, potential in, in the challenges we face. Okay, so I went too far. Let me back up, if you can back it up for me one slide and just hear from the, the audience and anyone online, feel free to chime in on the chat. Um, how do we feel about these shared agreements? Are we in agreement? Awesome, awesome. Anything that, that's not listed here that should be? Getting anything online? I'm not gonna forget about my folks no. online. Thank y'all for joining us online. All right, so here's where we're gonna already get y'all thinking and talking, okay? So we're talking about diversity, equity, and inclusion. I threw in the JAD, <laughs> the J-A-D, because uh, it does go beyond that. But the buzzword that we hear, um, and even in some, some places being weaponized, is diversity, equity, and inclusion. You've heard the term being used here already. 
But what if you really mean when you say these terms? What do we mean talking about, right? So we want to ground our understanding and definitions, and we want to have common language because that's super important, right? Sometimes we're all going towards this North Star, but it includes of excellence. But if we ground that, what are the steps that we're trying to take to get here? So what we're going to do is ask folks to turn to two or three, if you think create groups of three or four, just turn around and chat with each other. I want you to think about the term diversity in and of itself. Don't Google it. Don't try to sound politically correct. Just what's the initial definition or what do you think of? Or what do you think others kind of use um, that word as? And then um, I'll just ask for a few folks to share what does diversity mean? So we'll start with diversity first, then we'll get to equity and, and then inclusion. All right, so I'm gonna give y'all a few minutes to define diversity. Drop in the chat. How do you define Couple of remarks that come in online. We've got different backgrounds, cultures, abilities, genders, and religions. Uh, when people of many ways of being coexist, how about in, in the room here? Anybody want to shout out a definition that was uh, shared in your group? 
Yeah. I don't have a definition, but an example of rainforest. Rainforest. This represents diversity. Yeah. A unique consisting of uh, many species. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. How about one more? All right. Um, just give me one second. Okay, so for diversity, what what we tend to see typically, right? You see the submission statements and official documents. The definition that I like to share is a compositional diversity refers not only to the numbers, but also to recognizing the richness of perspectives, experiences, and backgrounds within a community. Right? So a pet peeve for mine is when we talk about recruitment, we all we often hear the term diversity and recruitment. But what are we really looking for when you're saying diversity and recruitment, right? So it's really important to get some common definitions. While the numbers are obviously critical, we also need to think beyond the numbers. And then where's the level of cultural competency or cultural humility in anyone who's hired uh, to serve, especially in the municipality? All right, so let's talk equity. Oh, giving away my. <laughs> All right, talk about equity for a couple of minutes. My picture might give it away already, but let's just go into the definition, right? Because I, I've let the cat out the bag already. Often you hear equity used interchangeably uh, with equality. And we know that those are two different things, right? All right, so equity and equality is two different things. Equity is about giving people what they need, um, striving for justice and fairness by acknowledging and rectifying past and present inequities. And some, some of these bold, swift actions that may take place may seem unfair um at the surface but when you're thinking about rectifying past and present inequities you understand you know the power of the image that's in front of you very very important you got to be equitable to get to equality so let's talk inclusion folks let's just take a couple of minutes and if we can get folks online into small groups with a timer are we able to do that but folks in the room can certainly turn to your groups and start chatting. What is inclusion? When we say that, what are we saying? Yeah. Is your comments coming in individually? And if you could drop in the chat, what do, how do we define inclusion? I'm going to ask them if they can just answer that. There's a clear line in the We have something from Taylor, uh, one of the businesses. <laughs> We have um, so if we're going to be doing the Zoom next time, they can uh, we can set up breakout rooms on the chat. On the chat, you have to do it like when you're setting Before, up. Yeah.
time, we've got some comments, inclusion, by example, is not only being invited to the dance, but being asked to dance. Anybody else talk about that? <laughs> I say true inclusion is letting me help you plan that party. <laughs> <laughs> All right, what, what else did we talk about as far as inclusion in this space? Being included in the decision-making process. Right, so not just having a seat at the table, but having your input valued. Giving a teeth. Yes, giving a teeth. Awesome. Anyone else want to share? Yes. Just the idea that inclusion, it has to come from intentionality. It needs to be a deliberate uh, intention of seeking out Yes, yes. And on a, even on a personal level, being inviting or opening up a sense of welcomeness to the approach uh, can definitions a sense of belonging and and the opportunity for equal and full participation for everyone watching an environment where every individual's uniqueness is valued and i think belonging takes a step further right so when we talk about this work i i i bring in dei 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 is what you hear all over the place right um but i i bring in that jazz like that that hook, that jazz, that awesome. <laughs> but the first is justice, right? We talk about action, not just talking the talk, but walking the walk. So when you think about justice from an actual perspective, um, there are a few definitions that I want to highlight. Um, it involves not just theoretical principles, but proactive and tangible steps towards fairness. Justice advocates for policy changes and initiatives that promote equality and equity, and it necessitates ongoing education and awareness to address implicit bias. Right there, yes, and the people in the back. Right, it inspires collective, collective is that key word, efforts to amplify marginalized voices and perspectives, right? People are not a minority. We often use that word to describe people. People have been minoritized, right. right? Okay, so when we move to the next word, it's accessibility. This is another one that we know is there. It's like in the corner somewhere needs to be centered. When it comes to accessibility, there are, again, a number of ways to describe it. I'm going to highlight a few. It involves ensuring that all individuals, regardless of their background, abilities, or characteristics, have equal access to opportunities, resources, and experiences. It encourages the design and implementation of inclusive practices and accommodations to accommodate diverse needs, necessitate ongoing evaluation and adjustment of structures to address evolving accessibility needs and inspire the commitment to universal design principles of making space information and activities accessible to everyone, right? So it goes beyond the physical, what we can see uh, when we talk about accessibility and that ongoing commitment to accessing, evaluating, and improving uh, accessibility for all. And that brings us to belonging, right? I can, folks can say I'm included in City Hall, I'm welcoming in City Hall, but when I walk in, do I feel that I belong? That, that's another level of inclusion, right? So belonging goes beyond inclusion, representing a, <clears throat> excuse me, it, it, a deepened sense of connection and acceptance within a community. And there's um, a, a psychological safety that comes with belonging as well that I think we have to be intentional about. All right, so we've gone through a number of definitions, right? So I, we want to get your, your good um, ideas. We want to get your assessment and feedback. So I want to help us clear our minds a little bit because we talked a lot already and you've come in 
with your entire day that you have gone through today, right? Trump day, right? So we're gonna take a mindful moment. This is also a great practice just for daily mindfulness. All you're gonna do is focus on your breathing. I'm gonna ask you to take four deep breaths and you're gonna take four breaths in, four breaths out. And you're gonna do four rounds of deep breathing and then we'll come back into the space. All right, so I'm gonna call folks back in for some of my voice. Okay, so I'm gonna invite my partner in crime, Nicole, up to help walk us through the SWOT analysis. I'm gonna be taking notes. I'm gonna have y'all continue working in groups. Thank you. Hey, everyone. <laughs> um, so my name is Nicole Pagliotti, I'm a project manager. I work closely with Dr. Barrows and my background and really my passions include access to healthcare, healthcare equity, housing, recovery services and social services and how do we get there. Um, my background also includes operational excellence, process improvement. Um, I have facilitated many SWOT analysis um, sessions with individuals and this is where the magic happens, is on the ground in these rooms, in these meetings. And um, I'm extremely impressed with the number of people that came out on a Wednesday night, took time out of their busy lives. You know, you're not with your kids tonight, you're here, which clearly shows that, you know, we wanna make the city of Malden a better place for all. So thank you, especially, and the people online, I mean, 25 people online, that's amazing. Um, has, and is everyone familiar with the SWOT analysis? Great, let's switch to the next slide. Um, so we're gonna have you break off into maybe like four groups, the corner of each room, and just take 10 or 15 minutes. And we'd like you to um, list out some of the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats that you see for the city of Malden. And really what this is gonna do is, is provide us with um, a framework to build out the strategic plan. And it, it's really important that we have the input from community members in order to do this, to ensure that we're moving in the right direction. I feel like I'm in and out. Um, so, and ex so some examples of strength, what is the city of Malden currently doing well in the space? Uh, what makes you unique? Um, I can tell you right now, like, driving up here from I live in Southern Rhode Island. It's a two hour drive today. And this is a beautiful city. Like I would I would really be proud to live here. It's, it feels safe, it's clean. Um, so I think you guys are ahead of the curve in many ways. And you know, what other strengths do you have? Um, weaknesses, where, where can we improve? Where do we wanna put our focus on moving forward in the next one to three years? And then what are the external, you know, what are the external maybe environmental factors that we, we don't have a lot of control over? Um, but as far as opportunity, like what is currently happening? What is taking place maybe outside of Malden, you know, at a, a state, state um, or federal level? Like what programs are out there? Maybe funding opportunities, maybe other programs that you can take advantage of. What are the opportunities? There's a lot invested in the space right now. And, um, you know, how can you, grab hold of some of those things. And then the most difficult one is looking at the threats and the challenges. Um, what are the main challenges that you feel you are facing right now? Um, so if we wanna take a few minutes to do that. Well, for us to discuss that focusing on strength. Do you wanna do that? Yeah, it's difficult to strength through the lens of DEI. Okay, we'll take a few minutes. We have some guiding questions here that can help you participate in. Um, we also have no time if you wanna take notes, but I promise you, we're gonna ask you to report out and I'll pass them in the Okay, but I'm gonna really... So, yeah. so give it maybe two or three minutes and focus on frames. Yeah. Okay. 
and folks online can drop their ideas on mm -hmm. a bunch of that. Yeah. I see they're doing that. So Two minutes. <laughs>
just about another minute, A group, and we're gonna. Um, if someone, if you all want to designate one speaker for your group, um, to go through what you came up with for strength, that would be great. All groups. Yeah, a strong a strong diverse community. Any others who want to share? Yep. Um, uh, specific kind of issues. Um, yeah. Basically, we are pretty excited about language and access. The city, again, very granular down to the to the that the city has done a good job with that and, and creating more and more access. It's sad there's always room to grow, but it's, it's um, when you look at other cities in our area. In, region yeah. they don't have as much access um there are a lot of community organizations a diversity of community organizations and infinity groups that represent the city and the city supports those things um when they can and that there's a lot of momentum and change coming and um it's not just as government but within our our city and and uh, the members of the city and um, another big diversity is just the new people, the influx of people that, that are choosing to make malt in their homes. And um, yeah, and just the general culture of openness that the city has. Thank you. Well, as we make our way around, try not to, if something's been said, let's not repeat it, anything new. You, you wanna go next? Uh, no, um, I think it's a great job, but it's hard to see it from back here the color. Oh, yeah, I'm here. I apologize. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Yeah. It's, it's a challenge for some of us. No, oh, that's me. Yeah. All of us. Okay. 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 Okay.
Um, so now we're actually seeing people who look like her, whether it be in restaurants, neighborhoods, and just all the things that we're missing here in the city, um, the town has become very inclusive. Um, to make a point. Um, also, when driving past her high school, um, she was able to see a rainbow. Um, so that was something that she didn't see growing up. Mm -hmm. And I'm pretty sure it's really great. Mm -hmm. okay. um, and then lastly, uh, willingness to try new things and to try <clears throat> under diversity. Um, she shared being a multicultural um, resident here in Malden and just seeing how much uh, the willingness to try new things has been really embraced in the city. Okay. <laughs> I'm just going to um, read a couple strengths that type into the chat. Um, diversity of our residents, we are the most diverse city in all of Massachusetts, and that's a beautiful thing. Thank you, Timor. Yeah, also said, she also said diversity of business owners and Thanks. Um, mm -hmm. it was her own point, so she got to say Who's next? Yeah, we uh, coincided on some of the strengths. Um, and one other one that was mentioned is that um, there is a diversity in leadership. So um, city government, as well as, um, for example, the library and the messages that the library is constantly sending out into the community. I work for a bunch of different volunteer uh, nonprofit groups, and there's pretty much a coincidence between leadership in general with that diversity message. Mm -hmm. And I think that's very positive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, like others, we kind of shared similar, but um, I would say the the sharing of uh, cultural experiences, the climate action process, um, the accessibility of our mayor. You know, we had the Instagram, and I think, uh, <laughs> no, it, it, it's a cool thing because I think it speaks to, you know, a leader in our community being vulnerable and being connected. And I think, you know, when we think about leadership, it's always one way. And as opposed to okay, let's try different methods of like connecting with people in the community. And I think that's what's call that uh servant leadership. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We've got a group in the back. So uh all of those things. Yeah. <laughs> and just, just like one or two things of that, you know, uh Mullen has this very unique uh that we are we're accessible. We're we have the bike trail that goes through that goes right through the city. We have the T right there that goes and enables us to go get into the city fairly efficiently, uh, efficiently. Um, it, and uh, you know, as my wife and Glenna said, you know, if you want to go and get to the ocean, it's twenty minutes. If you want to go and go and get to uh, Another region, if you want to go and get up to the to the mountains, it's it's 45 minutes to an hour. If you want to go and be go out west, we're not that far to go and jump on the pipe. It's it's and it's easy to get back in. So it's one of these things that we have that, that level of accessibility. Um, and the other thing is that I know that, that people are looking at the housing costs and moving costs, and yes, it's increasing in the area, but Malvin is still trying to go really work to be affordable. And that's, we, there's a reason why we want we have people that keep coming in constantly because we see it's a place where we can go and go to the community. We can do what they can to go and be able to go and pay for bills. And there's a lot of people that want to stay here because of that. Mm -hmm. On top of everything else. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. There's also a lot of support services here. Like we have a diverse population. We have low income, oh, everything that's what we've got. You know, everything from a recovery center to a wider art scene. We all have the recreationary people working at you know, getting access to the river, you know, um, the arts, the bike paths, all of that. So I think that really helps bring people in and, 
and offers a lot of um, things, support services. Yeah. We have a lot of things in the city. Yeah. And then that makes me think of uh, public safety. Any concerns about public safety in the city? Um, it just slipped my mind. I'll come back to them. Yeah. I think we have a police chief who's interested in change mm -hmm. and his values align with a lot of what we're talking about tonight. Look at that. I mean, we were from Malden and we felt welcome. And I think the other thing is Malden's traditionally been a, a community of immigrants. I mean, immigrants today are different than the ones 100 years ago. The people, the people who are the established people have some perspective. They, at one time, were immigrants. So there's a welcome. It's not 100%, but I think the reason why we're diverse in this diverse community as we are, because people have felt welcome and have felt supported from coming from places. So there's almost that tradition that um, it's a tradition of being welcoming and welcome difference. I think it's uh, those differences change every generation, but. I mean, I don't think we'd be the community we are without that that tradition. We haven't been an exclusive. So we've been an inclusive in development. I was, I was going to add to with respect to the many support services. Um, one of the things I think about too is not only did I find community when I first, you know, moved to Mountain ten years ago, but Social media has been played a big part in terms of watching many residents in Walden connect. One of the things I was thinking about with the Walden neighbors helping neighbors. And, you know, basically a group of people that I don't know who started the group, but it made it possible for people to try to support others that are in need. And I think it speaks to my. <laughs> <laughs> but it, 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 it would be several other people, but uh, just <laughs> but it's a beautiful thing because it really shows the heart of people in Malden and the great work that's being done. Like if someone's in need of supplies or something for their kids or whatever, there's always people in the comments. How can I help? I'll DM you a message of people help. And that's awesome. Right, right. Um, and I, and I just add, what makes that unique too, it didn't emanate from the government. Usually it's the government setting this stuff up. This emanated from the community. Yeah. yeah. And, and obviously, again, I'll speak. Uh, the people that organized with me, I had never met before. Yeah. Literally, we, came, we all had kind of the same idea at the same time. And more connected. Yeah. Um, and that's how we create a mutual sector. I think there's a large density of good intentions in the in this, in this city. Yes. So it is so important to, to highlight and be aware of our strengths so that we know where we can play on those strengths, right? It's also important to think about our, I like to say, challenge points. Right. So it's like putting that mirror up to, to ourselves and being honest. Let's talk about where those challenges lie. Okay. Uh, in the city of Malden, when we're thinking about it from a PDI lens, what are our weaknesses or challenge points? You've got some guided questions to get it from me. Okay.
All right, we're gonna start uh, for the sake of time. We're gonna start with the online. Uh, we have a response for the parent. We need still on work that has already been done to gain trust in the community that we are listening and continuing to move forward together. Many have done great work with community and we should be involved in tour in the city. I'm so glad this is happening, but we have to acknowledge work in the past. Who wants to go next? Yeah, we got a lot in, in you know, both. We'll work. collect all those pads now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, my group, we talked about a few things um, lack of diverse teachers in the schools that the students feel like they saw themselves represented, represented in school. Um, and similarly, um, lack of representation or a little representation of city government in terms of diversity and leadership. Um, relying on grant funding, that was one. Uh, having the ability to have deeper conversations as it relates to structural racism, like how do we empower people to become practitioners of change? You know, how do we activate people in the community to really Think, not only think about this work, but really challenge structures that um, create these barriers for various groups and communities. And housing challenges, uh, affordability. Malden's a beautiful city, and yet, you know, many people are faced with the challenge of trying to remain in their homes because the cost, you know, the costs are high. And how do we address that in Malden? And then never, I had over, uh, never having the resources to do everything that the city wants to do. All of them actually there, that's just glad of uh, having enough resources for that. And that was our thing. Thank you. We, this is a hot one because we've had a few more coming on. Um, we is it lack of affordable housing, employment opportunities for our youth, lack of educators of color and MBS. Uh, another weakness uh, infrastructure of our city. We need to be way more open and intentional on what will actually work rather than making decisions we feel like we should do or that are trendy, popular, etc. Another one, uh, our teachers, local government, and workers do not reflect the diversity of our city. Thank you, online. Who wants to go next? Yeah. Um, just a couple of things that. Uh... I'm on the school committee, and we do a really good job of going providing translation for people coming in over Zoom, but not for people that might want to walk in and be here or present. Mm -hmm. And also, uh, we don't do that at all at city council. If someone can't understand what's what's being talked about, then they're going to feel automatically disconnected from government. Uh, and just a couple, you know, maybe larger things, but just, you know, uh, well, and this, because we have this history of, of, of being diverse, sometimes it kind of gets plumbed over that that we don't <coughs> kind of got that strong. We said we don't talk about some of these things because it's always, hey, I have different neighbors and they're all a different thing. We just get along, but then it's never the the, but then you know we don't talk about. Hey, what you said was uh, painful or hurtful. Um, mm -hmm. Sometimes there's a big, sometimes a lack of um, an unintentional lack of empathy mm -hmm. because you say, "Hey, this is the way that it's always been." And it's like, no, we need to change. Mm -hmm. We can see things and people, and I think that's one of those things that we kind of take for granted here mm -hmm. that we have the diversity, but it's going to doing that deeper level of work. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Yeah, we, we hit upon similar things. We we talked about we fix surface issues, but we don't address systemic issues. Um, there's a lack of diversity in the way we organize, just in in the way we run meetings and things like that. You know, like many cultures don't understand Robert's rules or you know how you know even the hierarchy of a, of a council or anything is organized. We are um, still pretty racially segregated. Um, there are, you know, there's the affluent side of town and and uh, economically segregated as well. Um, there, 
people in power are comfortable uh, was one. And um, I just brought up another good one. There's a lack of public meeting space for the diverse community groups that exist in the city. And that's something we would, we would like to see them um, changed. Um, but mostly you know, we hit we hit the bottom saying mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I feel like a lot of that is never the same, but uh, uh, the higher you go for the governance of there is no real diversity. Um, leadership needs to be more inclusive in the city. Um, Malden is pretty big for games when thinking about affordable housing. Um, and not enough just here to cover that. I think we had a lot of different things as well. Um, the one that was mentioned was for more potentially need for more translations, like so interpreting uh, meetings, but also potentially written written formats or the adaptives in general. Um, we were thought of us figuring out how to reach different populations. So do we how to effectively do outreach um, to you know invite people in from some different populations to be part of decision making things. Um, and then maybe loss of sense of community or neighbors knowing as neighbors um, sort of in the day of age. But yeah. Maybe yeah. talk about that. Yeah. Um, I, I added uh, that um, Carol says we need more educators of color in our school systems. Our teachers do not look like our students, mm -hmm. not nearly enough. And also um, thinking about disability issues. Mm -hmm. um, so both of my children are autistic and I'm starting to see some new hires for parents who also identify as being not neurodiverse. Mm -hmm. um, but there are lots of ways to provide more role models for our students in, in that arena as well. Um, and on disability issues, when I think about just the, the physical accessibility of that city in general, just you might think that they're small, but they're not small, right? When the sidewalks are plowed out, or even the curb cut isn't shoveled out, um, out of all these sorts of things. So I guess maybe that falls into the what public works. You know, we can build the infrastructure, but if we don't maintain it, mm -hmm. right, and make sure it's accessible quickly after yeah. things, it, it, Really can shut down the city for, for those that rely on those um, very good point. Thanks. structures, right? Anyone else? Uh, I don't know if someone said this overtly, but there's not enough opportunity to learn English. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a huge way to mess up in the learning center. There's not enough, enough free or evening classes and things like that. More people need uh, assistance in learning English. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, nope. All right, so let's be centered in these challenges that we name because with challenges come what? So let's talk about the opportunities that we have. Remember what I said. Let's not think like there is a box. There's no box. Right? I'm not outside the box, no box. If we had all the resources, what what are the solutions and opportunities rather for addressing some of these challenges?
I see the passion in the audience. I love it. Who would like to go first? Opportunity. Wait a minute. You guys want to go first? Yes, thank you. I'm the I'm the lead for tax of 20 years for the city. And I am so happy that you guys are complaining <laughs> right now. Language access. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I cherish when you find spaces where we need work. Those are my opportunities. Mm -hmm. So put them all in there because eventually we'll get there. Mm -hmm. Now, with those opportunities, I'm going to go back to the back of that board. We you know the challenge here is that I'm the only one, and this is the first time that the city has had this position all that. So let this be an opportunity to hey, bring more people to work with me. You know, and we I can you know just share the workload, we can move faster creating these opportunities. Now, one of the opportunities was that and something that was just mentioned lack of English classes. Today, tonight, we are launching an opportunity for the community where we are looking for community members to be trained to run small groups of um, English conversations. Mm -hmm. Similar to what we have in the library, we have one in the city right now, which is in the library, and it's overflowing. Tonight, those huge posters over there are calling out for community members to step up and help me mm -hmm. because I have been working you know, to this point. Yeah. You know, just to solve those, you know, those Perfect. Perfect. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. So that's one of the opportunities that you know, this conversation. So I just think um, taking an opportunity to take on the trends that are helping uh, towards diverse efforts are, are a huge advantage. And, and I'm sure that's helped all the new schools tremendously since. Um, so I want to say that's a great thing for the state in general. Uh, it doesn't just pertain to all of this, it started in all this. It's nice to know that we can look at things. How, how can I capture that as an opportunity to, you say, to raise more awareness? Um, to take a bunch of friends that, and, and uh, apps that are in progress. Like the Crown app was going around. It was so small when it started. Yeah. It was so small. And now there's a lot of students that have signed on. I'm very happy that Massachusetts has signed on. And um, again, it started in Malden, but now it, it won't affect any Malden child again. Uh, checking it well, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Did I have anything for y'all? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Great. That's good. Um, yeah. So when we, we noticed that like, looking at the strengths and looking at the weaknesses, there were some where, where they kind of really not accepted to the other. So they said that we need more diverse um, diversity of teachers in Melbourne public schools. We need more diversity in uh, leadership in the government. And we have a very diverse population um, in Malden. So um, calling on like the diverse population of Malden um, to become those teachers and, and those leaders. Um, someone mentioned about like programs to, you know, if there's a gap in 
people's readiness to be in these roles, like programs to educate, elevate, and give opportunities to people um, to like gain the, the experience or qualifications to do these things. Um, pay teachers more. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> or get creative with programs that like hire new teachers and support them or uh, pay or pay them like more while, while they're working to get degrees. Um, and then in order, the other point that we talked about in order to figure out how to reach diverse populations um, is visit mosques, churches, temples, community centers, and communicate with those the leaders at those places to ask to disseminate information and communicate with those in those communities. Sometimes you don't get the right reach the people you need to reach. So being yeah. more creative and going out and outreach to the place where they go. So uh, we talked about you know similar themes and what's listed there, but like a TEDx Malden that um, creates an opportunity for members in the community who talk about, you know, DEI, B, jab <laughs> related uh, topics. And I think it falls into the bucket of learning and development. Um, if there's an opportunity where members of the Malden community can, whether it's on the city of Malden website, but various topics that people can learn about that it becomes like a library of knowledge and training that's available. If it's through LinkedIn learning with a partnership with the city, that's one. If not, then that there are people who can develop these content from intersectionality, the power of inclusive language, religious diversity, um, and, and more. So. Mm -hmm. I have some more things to that. Um, and uh, I'm, a, I'm a city councilor, and I take the point really seriously about how hard it is to figure out Robert's rules and like what's happening in city council meetings and planning board meetings and all these really important decisions. And I think we do a lot of inclusive planning processes, but the city might do 10 different inclusive planning processes in a year. And so what would it look like if we reimagined all of that together as one unified public input process that was in plain language, we could really get the word out and we all designed it on what would be easy for residents to tell us what they think. It would be driving it from a totally different perspective. Um, so that's one imagination I have. And another is that we're starting this master planning process with the city and Malden has, you know, not tried to accelerate development for some time, but would, would that create an opportunity where we can have development without uh, displacement and gentrification? This has been very difficult for many communities and cities to do, but I think some of the ingredients are here in Malden to be able to do that and empower our businesses. So could we be a model for development without displacement in this next chapter of our city? That's my question. Thank you. Mr. Yes, Brooke, over here. Yes, um, so hit a lot of those problems, but um, supporting and uplifting our diverse businesses and micro businesses. Um, whether it's, you know, giving grant opportunities um, to also to groups and to community groups as well. Um, we talked a lot about kind of community uh, cultural competency and trying to figure out how to organically do that kind of stuff. So whether it's uh, cultural exchanges for like community meals or at the garden with, you know, kind of doing that stuff, we're, we're doing those things, but I think we could do better and we could do more. There's more opportunities to get those kinds of things. Um, and just having meaningful conversations um, and bringing diverse people together in a room to have more, I guess, cultural competency is, is kind of like understanding each other's cultures and giving the opportunity intentionally to talk about one another's cultures. Thank you. Yeah. And something just so I work for a, um, a youth uh, job training program that operates in Malden, and um, one of the challenges that a lot of our young people face after they've gotten the job training, I would say one thing is like I think 
be doing more of a location, uh, location focus inside of Walden um, to build out opportunity for the young people. Mm -hmm. um, but then the other thing I would add is that there are a lot of barriers to get into location with like building trades opportunities, which is one of the like strongest ways to make money is out of college education. Right. And, that, and that is access to the car. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of young people in our program face this challenge of like they want to invest in their lives and their families in a career that would be able to sustain their families. Mm -hmm. But to, to be able to get into that work, you have to be able to get the car. You're going to get your drivers. It's, it's, it's not cheap to do that. Mm -hmm. um, we have the Safe Communities Act that was passed that allows um, all, all folks, regardless of, of status, to get a driver's license. But the cost is like, it can be like 800 to $900 just to go through a driver's ed class and then get a car. And then you don't even have a car. Like, then you have a real problem because how are you learning? <laughs> um, so, you know, I think there's kind of this like, something I've been thinking about a lot is like, what if we had the city had some type of a mechanics program where you learn to go into an industry like your model repair and you can repair, restore cars that are donated mm -hmm. and then um, sell them back to folks who are trying to make it into. An industry like that. So I just, I mean, I think there's that's one large barrier that there's an opportunity that Malden could be part of. Thank you. We have a few online. Um, there could probably be more initiative, initiative from local governments to look at feedback about outreach from community members on areas they think could be improved for our resources to improve equity, particularly for residents who first like language is an aspect from um, English, excuse me. Um, secondly, we need to be a no place or aid community, and this needs to include training and programs for all the school community and local community. Has not been safe spaces for our Jewish families, how can we be protected from hate speech and act in our community in partnership with the future of all the EI initiatives? Another opportunity listed energy around the modernization of downtown, a show of man to live and work in Malden, actively work to the standard of racism. Do we, oh, I am thinking this one um, from Paul. Do we have any sort of grow your own teacher initiative here in all that are made by cities to support building or representative teaching work for? Someone else? Yes. Um, just, a, just a couple things. Um, one, uh, you know, the, uh, the, uh, the transit community stuff that's going on right now. We have a, a, a fantastic opportunity to go and look at our zoning, make sure that we're going and putting affordable housing and, and making those real changes so that people, again, people complain about the cost of housing. We have the ability to go into things like going and building triple, triple deckers and reimagining how we've got our, our stuff going along the train thing. Um, one of the things that, that's for me is like, I love only looking at the Ed Everly thing that we've got back over here on Shade Street, but it's hidden behind parking zone. And I know it gets used, but I would love to go and see stuff like that kind of expanded out to all of our parks and, and the parks that are like very visible, you know, let's go and put something like that on the beer so that that we can have that there. Uh, you know, we're doing the the, uh, the parts that are up over on uh, on Eastern Ave, so that people that you know, one of the signs of a growing community is going and having people that want to have their families and they want to go and have their kids playing, and we're doing the work to go and fix our parks, and we can go and we can do things like going and providing these like very creative places for people to go and have their toddlers and babies and kids going and playing these things. And then, you know, one of my personal things is, is that where I live on Eastern Ave, all the businesses there is this gigantic wall of gray <laughs> that goes that goes literally from Bryant Street almost all the way down uh, to, to Linden. And I would love to go and see us go and partner with the businesses along there and say, let us go and put some art in these spaces. We have a fantastic art community 
and we only do it along the bike trail, but unless you're riding your bike there, you don't necessarily get to see that. And these are, again, communities that are not necessarily exposed to things like that. That's great that we did the, the switch boxes, but let's go and think bigger. We've got these big campuses and we can put, we can go and say, hey, is it something that we can engage people in? Can we get students involved that are, you know, that love to go and do art? Can we go and figure out how to go and make this, this look not gray, but vibrant, diverse, something that, that Malden really is. So that people aren't, we're not a drive through town, we're a, we're a drive slow through town. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I think we can do a better job to activate our young people, our children, and our uh, youth who have always creative ideas out of the box ideas. They don't see the box oftentimes. So putting them in positions of leadership or influencing, contributing to, to our process of solving problems. And in also there's tremendous energy among the artists who are performers, musicians, writers, designers, and so forth, to use you know, even the creative process to solve problems and to approach it from a different angle using visual, using the media. Um, we just had a film building modern program which uses used media to sort of offer that as a lens to who is modern. Um, and then I think there's tremendous power in the entrepreneurial community. We talked about that, but uh, thinking entrepreneurially about if we have language of uh, deficiency in language, okay, how can we use the entrepreneurial process mm -hmm. to activate those people who might want to gain a living? Teach and start a business, another business, or another nonprofit. Mm -hmm. yeah. So those are three energy sources. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Mm -hmm. All right. That brings us to threats. Mm -hmm. The threat that we want to think about really an external threat, right? So we talked about our uh, challenges, our strengths, the opportunities, but there are things that are outside of our control, whether they're uh, within the city or they're regional, they're statewide or national. So we think about our efforts towards this pursuit for inclusive excellence, equity. What, what are those threats we have to be mindful of as we are thinking about our strategic choice? And they are pretty guys trying to get here as well. <laughs> We'll have a short time to get your feedback. Okay, let's hear it.
Hey guys, we're going to bring it back into the class. We've already heard things that we talked about about silicone polarization as an effect to to make progress. Yeah. Um, things like moral issues that are going on that threaten our sense of unity, um, that make it difficult for for people to see past um, you know, the issues that are very mm -hmm. central to them. Um, also, backlash to things like DEI or or supposed critical race theory being taught in schools like. Any sort of backlash against against sort of diversity initiatives in schools um, and outside of schools, um, as well as extreme weather, like these things, just you know, make everything harder to sort of that intersection of climate change, um, economic problems, and housing struggle, like it, it, out in Malden, outside of Malden. You know, it just seems to be getting harder and harder. Cost of living, right? Cost of living. Um, and train on resources, lack of resources to address needs of new immigrants um, and everyone. So, yeah, just a lot of limiting, limiting factors like that. Thank you. Uh, we have uh, we brought up a lack of funding and mm -hmm. access access to funding. Um, we talked about um, the lack of a diverse, unbiased local journalism and mm -hmm. having more diverse voices that are covering things like this so that people can have more access mm -hmm. and understand that at least it's happening. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of times things happen in the city, and again, I know people are. Advertising on Facebook and putting it here and there, but again, we're not reaching, and so I think that that feeds that hate that people are talking about, um, and we talked a lot about that as well. Just the hate rhetoric that's going on, a lot of the people that want us to go back in time and and you know, that kind of stuff. We also um, fear of change, and and just people that are really they feel like they're not being met where they're at because. Of, of all the changes. And um, we talked about our immigrant communities and just, you know, like the lack of, you know, they're they're here to survive, right? Mm -hmm. And so getting them to participate is asking a lot because they don't have the bandwidth, like they're working two or three jobs. So how do we, you know, how do we solve that problem? How do we figure out how to reach people like that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Um, I did why I think a lot of this was covered already. Uh, you know, at the federal level, uh, right now we see a lot of uh, political predicament. It's, you know, uh, we're, we're seeing things at the top not going to be necessarily going to the number of the more work one another. And you know, unfortunately, that trickle down all the way down to the city level. Uh, uh, someone mentioned environmental impacts and, and climate change. Uh, one of the big things is that there's a lot of you know misinformation and trust in, in information that the city might well provide. And even just things like uh, you know, and specifically for this, is that when someone here goes and says, Hey, I experience someone moves into the city and say, Hey, you're you're being unkind or you're being and they say, No, I'm not. Not being able to go and have that, that level of empathy for someone that has that different level of uh, uh, experience. Um, uh, a weaponization of terminology. Okay. You know, we don't we hear about we heard about DEI, we heard about, you know, uh, CRT was the big thing when I first ran. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. and having to explain on the board with every literally good <laughs> chunk of people what what critical race theory was, and that you know, were we teaching it in the school? What did it mean? Having everyone have that that deeper conversation with people that were going to vote for me, 
And I'm sure that I lost a few votes because they said no, but I did get quite a few people that said that. But that came from outside Wall. That, that was that was generated by forces that were in no control of the people's hearing that. Uh, and also, uh, you know, finally, just you know, the experience of here is that you know we have IT and that a lot of our servers were locked in through that, and you know we had a we had a hacking attack. And knocked us out for a good chunk of time. And I trust our IT director, and he did a really good job of going and getting us back up to speed, but it took a while. And in that time, how many people had called for a service and couldn't get it? And I don't know where it came from originally, but you know, there's a lot of people out there that, that learn this stuff and don't see what they can get. And it's something that, you know, if someone comes in, you can't all of a sudden access the language access. For, for an important meeting, or we have someone that's died uh, that's going through an overdose, and we can't go in contact. We have to go and try to go and contact somebody in the fire department to pull out there, and we can't trigger that. So that's something that we need to be worried about. Yes, I mean, cyber attacks is like mass weapon, you know, you can do a lot of damage. Well, I, I can see that we link with the weaponization piece to the, right. the DEI piece, but I think linking it to the unbiased journalism and the misinformation mm -hmm. piece is also equally as important because I think what we're seeing, and we see it on a local level, is masquerading as journalism or pushing narratives <laughs> that are clearly are not true or trying to take something like DEI or CRT and saying, well, this is the definition of it. And like, we can't, we can't just choose what a fact is anymore. Right. Uh, I think the weaponization of misinformation is really a threat to space on a national level, but a local level too. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, we have one from online. Um, When we were thinking about what's happening outside of Malden that impacts us and mm -hmm. where we want to be and where we want to go, I always think of Malden as being because we are on the super, super sensitive and not just like the Malden housing market, right? Mm -hmm. So it's other parts of the city become expensive, uh, whether it's some of the Hoolers or Boston. People are looking, I still need to get to work, <laughs> but I still have to live on the team. Where's the poor going out, yeah. right? And so I, I always think of Malden as housing market being really to the possibility and sure. it's all balanced by the US and connected. So that's just like an outside factor. Right. Thank you. Yeah. I just feel talking about the weaponization or misinformation to point out that um communities like immigrant communities, communities where English is the first language are more susceptible and more vulnerable to that misinformation and spreading of misinformation because they're not used to, they might not be, as, they're not as familiar with the systems of communication in the US, like what news sources we trust, et cetera. Um, and, and if they can't read the mainstream news, so they can be more, more vulnerable to WhatsApp messages being sent around, et cetera. So it just makes the outreach that much more important to build trust. With people in those communities and make things available in, in different languages. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Sure. So, um, like others, we talked about you know, money, um, budget cuts, uh, cultural backlash, and some groups, climate disasters, slash environmental racism. Um, others mentioned like global issues and also social media mm -hmm. as well. That I see even for myself. Thinking about this event and how it was, you know, advertised, you know, really was brought out some 
of the ugliest parts of people in the world. Yeah. And I think um, there's so much fuel for like hatred yeah. mm -hmm. and just not only hatred in this work, but just hatred of people. Mm -hmm. um, I think as we continue to think about, you know, doing this work, that's what we're fighting against. Mm -hmm. so, and that also poses a threat to just well-being of mm -hmm. people that are actually grounded in this work. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Yes. I think we're doing a lot of, uh, I'll say that we're going to turn over, turn over. A, lot, a lot of really interesting, really impactful things, both in the government and also in the community. Mm -hmm. And as we see um, people turn over, whether those are elected leaders or staff, or just community members and, and neighbors moving, um, there's a lot of risk that if we don't turn these actions into systems mm -hmm. and we don't institutionalize this work, mm -hmm. when we are not in this room and other people are in this room, mm -hmm. we might be having the same conversation 10 years later. Mm -hmm. And we want them to be building off of what we're doing. Yeah. Again, both inside the government and also outside of the government. Can I, can I add to that too? Just hearing what you said, you know, it's so true about like systems and also like keeping record of what's being done. But I think somebody had mentioned, or I don't know if it was online, about a lot of work has been done, but many people don't know. You know, to your point, people don't know, so it often gets duplicated. So, you know, how do we track that? How do we keep record of that? So people are aware this has been done years ago, this is where we're headed. So we can also see progress too. You know, like even thinking about, and this is just in my head, envisioning like this timeline of like all diversity efforts and all how we've grown, you know, over time. Mm -hmm. You know, like I think it's, it can be a beautiful thing when you capture that and see that and whether, you know, it evolves into some sort of initiative or project where students, people in the community kind of do some sort of art type of, um, work that captures this is where we started this is where we are 20 30 years later that you have that trajectory of just keep climbing up and whether you're providing opportunities for learning and engagement community building so, so. Um, this is more of an internal technical question but um and it's the scarcity of mentality so I work for a nonprofit. Most nonprofits I know are always talking about we don't have enough people, we don't have enough time, we don't have enough interest, we don't have enough space. I hear that from the city as well. Mm -hmm. Budget, we don't have enough money. But instead of thinking that way, go to the wild imagination, find people who can find those resources. There's always a way. There's a new way to raise money for schools. There's a new way, you know. Um, so out of the silos too, right? Yeah. And I was just going to say that even though this is a nice conversation, but then we go back to our respective organizations, we don't have the pathways of connection and sharing ideas, drawing from, let's say, the entrepreneurs to help with the wild, you know, finding the money. So, you know, you stick within your content mm -hmm. and you won't find the answers there. Mm -hmm. So I think having a pathway to having constant conversation and feedback loop about what's working, how can we move forward and drawing from the diverse expertise to solve the problems on one of those mixes. Yeah. Okay, we have one more comment. Um, yeah, kind of, I guess not to sort of an opportunity, but I just, I think there's a lot of cumulative harm that's being held in a lot of spaces in Malden from various you know, this is a basis of discrimination bias. And I, I I feel like we need some type of remediation process or a restorative justice process where when communities or when the instances occur where uh, we can do and feeling like we're talking to each other and that we can act or over each other. Um, mm -hmm. It just, it, it, I feel, I mean, it's, it's happening online, in social media, it's happening in person, at events and meetings, mm -hmm. with things that are politically or um, racially charged, and um, we need some type of like, healing process. Mm -hmm. really That's a very nice mission. Yep. Mm -hmm. Just, I don't know.
Yeah. Thank you. And I saw two more guests pop up and then we're going to go back there. Um, I, I just was kind of piggybacking off the, the, the wish, the, the not recreating the wheel kind of thing, right? We, what was it, 10 years ago or 12 years ago that we're, before Marlin Corps started, the, the, I can't remember, it was uh, Susie Deer, what was called the, the, the community unity thing. The community yeah. unity thing. And, and that to me seemed like it was much more centered specifically on race. And I think that like the idea then was kind of more focused on that. And I feel like we expanded it to be more like, again, even the diversity of diversity, right? Yeah. Like, intersectionality. Intersectionality. And, and not just that, but like, again, thinking about what it is to feel othered. And so I do think that like that's what we need to be centering on. Like, and, and again, it's not to say that there's not anti-blackness or anti-Asian hate or LGBTQ, you know, homophobia going on, but that we need to always kind of keep focused on right now. This is where we're at, and also know that we're building on the future to what what lies ahead. Thank you. Well, the last topic. I was just gonna say Yeah. Especially like, you know, when we talk about all the objectives, like we want to talk about the well being of people doing this work, the vulnerability of the, the mayor consistently being vulnerable, yeah. pushing back on CRT narratives and doors, on why we need to like not get tired from doing this work and remember that even when we're building systems, that mm -hmm. it's, it's purposeful. Mm -hmm. So, much of yeah. I, I, I want to name that race, race is the most um, for all the technical questions that exist for that country. So that's always going to be centered and important to see that intersectionality as part of our lens and doing this work and having these conversations. Okay. So you all have done an amazing job getting a lot of information out. This is just the beginning. This is the first of, of many other conversations. There's going to be obviously a deep look and assessment and understanding of how do we expand from uh, the great work that y'all have identified today. I'm going to say thank you for your participation, especially for those who have stuck with us online. <laughs> um, and I'm going to pass the floor back to Michelle. <laughs> Yeah, so we would love to have all the, the writing, so please make sure you grab those off. Okay, so first, thank you so much for participating. This went amazing. I'm like super excited about the info that everyone has shared, and I think it'll be really good to take this back and, and really process and see all of the good work that we have to start doing um, or continuing, I can say. Um, so what have we learned? Um, we definitely got a lot of information about the city, what we need to work on, what's good about what we're doing, and what we need to continue. Um, what will we do with this information? We're going to take it and um, we have the, the racial equity audit team uh, here that they're going to help us kind of process the information and see, you know, what to do with it and how we can uh, work on those things. Um, one thing that's super important is that we will be having the next public meeting, which will be Wednesday, March 6th from 6 to 8 p.m. So that gives us some time to kind of process this information and then come to you with next steps of, you know, our plan and what we're gonna be doing to kind of work on all these things. Um, so it'd be wonderful if you could attend that as well. Um, and then there's the feedback form. Um, so we'll leave the screen up. So if you want to see it again or um, check out the link there and just give us our, your feedback on, you know, how you thought this went, um, just generally about the meeting. And then if there are any comments or thoughts that you have, to kind of add on to our discussion tonight or anything that you forgot to mention or whatever, um, please, uh, please click on that and, and add those comments there as well. All right, and so that concludes our- oh, Hold on before you, before you click. <laughs> Sorry. Um, just very quickly, I wanted to, I, is it possible to just ask the members of the Racial Equity Commission to just- Oh, yes, yes, so sorry. Forgot about, <laughs> actually, yes, yes. So um, the Racial Equity Commission, um, the members wanna- Come on up and just at least stand in the room. And thank you people. And Juan Juan. And I'm Councilor Kerry McDonald. And we've got Ralph. Ralph Long. Ralph Long. Uh-huh. I think we got Cassandra, Cassandra Davis. And of course, Kishana.
Exactly. Is that all? We do have some youth members also, depending on those who are on hiatus, but thank you to those for being 